Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. There's a really interesting account found in 2 Kings 4. So if you can open your Bibles, your journals, and I don't think we've got notes this morning. No, because there is a reason for that, but I won't digress. Now, a certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. This is pretty desperate. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels at large for yourself. From all your neighbors, even empty vessels do not get a few. Turn to your neighbor and say, not a few. And you go in and shut the door behind you, you and your sons, and pour into all the vessels, and you shall set aside what is full. Turn to your neighbor and say, full. Okay. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing vessels and, sorry, and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. Now, that's a pretty cool miracle to take place. And we're always expectant of a miracle. But you know, when Jesus came and was sent from the Father as a baby, That was a miracle, and the joy set before him was all the multiplication that came out of that sacrifice. And in this story, we see that something large came out of something very, very small. And this lady, man, did she have a lot in her life going on. I mean, seriously, tradition says that the guy who was her husband was the prophet Obadiah. Now, that's what tradition teaches. So it's not in the Bible, but that's tradition. And Obadiah was a preacher of righteousness. He is the prophet that hid the 100 prophets when Jezebel was wanting to take off their heads. Um, Nice. It's a nice girl, wasn't she? There are some people in your life you really need to avoid, and those are the kind. Uh, It's not hard to spot now, is it? So he hid the, the 100 prophets. He was a servant of Ahab, and he died. Now, he left behind him a debt. It was a massive debt, because this is the bottom line of it. His debt was greater than his assets. You never have a debt that is greater than your asset. I always say to the guys and the kids, you don't borrow money to buy toys. You don't borrow money to buy a jet ski. That's a toy. You don't borrow money to buy toys because the minute you walk out of the store, that toy isn't worth anything. So therefore, your invest, your debt is greater than your asset. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. Do you get that on live stream? Your debt should not be greater than any of your assets. And this man had left behind a debt that was greater than his assets. Now, whether he died unexpectedly, whether uh, Jezebel had him murdered, we're not really sure because the death of Obadiah is not taken into account in the Bible. Once again, it's speculation, or we could just create, you know, a backstory based on true events. Okay. (laughs) It's a liberty of the writer of the script, I guess. So she went, this woman, the wife of, if she was, the wife of a prophet, decided that there was only one course recourse for her, and that was to go to the source, to the man of God. She didn't go to her friends. She didn't create a give a little web page, you know. She didn't go to any strangers. She went to the man of God. 
she went exactly to him and cried out to Elisha. And she really was serious about what she needed. And of course, in the New Testament, we hear about the woman crying out to the judge so that she can get her petition heard. And this is her words, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Now, did his fear of God remove his obligation to repay his debt? No. And so often as Christians, we think just because we're Christians, bad times won't hit us. But we live in a fallen world, church. We live in a fallen world. So the vultures are now circling. <laughs> Aren't they cute? <laughs> I had to find some friendly or funny looking vultures. They, yeah, okay, I know, they're from Lion King, if you really want to know. She really is a child. Um, <laughs> and the creditors have come to take my children to be his slaves. So this man had created a debt that was cr greater than his worldly assets. He then dies and he leaves his wife to have to sort the stuff. And so the creditor now comes and says, I want your two sons to be my slaves and to be my servants. Now, tell me, tell me, tell me, is there legal ground for that? You've gone silent. You gotta know, yes. The creditor had total legal ground to require from her her sons as her slaves. See, we ask God for stuff so often, but we've got this outstanding legal ground that the enemy is occupying in our lives. It is part of the word of God that if you're in debt or if you have loaned something, you get it restitution back to you. You see, this whole thing works both ways. It works both ways. The creditor has a right to take what belongs to him. And you and I have a right to demand from Satan that he get off our patch and give us back what rightfully belongs to us. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is our Savior. He is our God. He has redeemed us and He has set us free. In that is our health, our healing, our prosperity. And we can demand that the enemy give back what he has stolen. And we can demand that he give back more than what he took in the first place because it's in the Bible. And it works for you and me. But it also works for the one who's holding the cards of credit. And we'll get into more of that as the story goes along. So Elisha said to her, what do you want me to do for you? What needs to be accomplished here? Tell me what is in your house. So here we go. Her husband created a debt. Now we need to create an investment. So he says to her, where is your investment? You have got a huge debt, lady, and your sons have, you, the, the creditor has legal ground to take your sons. Where is your investment? Where can I get a hold of something that is your investment? It doesn't belong to your husband, and it doesn't belong to the creditor. Where is there an investment? Tell me what you have in the house. See, whatever you invest in the house, Pastor Greg took up our tithes and offerings before. We did the um, missionary offering. We have sacrificial next year. Um, every year we do different offerings. We do our tithes and offerings on a weekly basis. And whatever you invest in the house does not belong to the creditors. The creditors have no legal right over it. They cannot touch it. The enemy has no legal right over what is in the house. It does not belong to him. Everything in the house belongs to God. Everything in the house. And so he, Elisha says to her, what have you got in the house? What is there that I can work with? 
What investment have you made that we can work with? And she said, your maidservant, see, they have a relationship, has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Good, he says. We can work with that. That's all she had was a jar of oil. And he said to her, then go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you, you and your sons. Now, I thought that was so cool. He tells her some very explicit instructions, but he doesn't actually tell her the outcome. So he tells her to do all these things without the promise. See, but we want the promise first. And then we'll do it, God. God, you give me the guarantees and the money, and the wherewithal, and then I might, I might just, you know, get on board with what you're asking me to do here. He was giving her very, very clear instructions, and she got on board with what he was saying, right? So that he could do something with what she had, but she had to fulfill that which was required of her. So she has to go in, and she has to shut the door. When Jesus was approached by Jairus, to see his daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, who had then died. Jairus had arrested him along the way to come and see his daughter, but in the meantime, his daughter died. When Jesus went into the, into the house and everybody was weeping and wailing, he went into the room where Jairus' daughter was laying. He went in there with Peter, James, John, Jairus, Jairus' wife, and the, dead, the girl who was dead and himself. That's seven people. And he shut the door. When she shut the door behind her, she silenced the voices. When Jesus shut the door behind him, he silenced the voices. Because they were all saying, what are you doing? She's already dead. Who do you think you are? Why are you coming in here and upsetting us all and giving us hope when there is no hope, basically? And he shut the door to the voices and went inside and we see the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. And here we see this miracle taking place because she goes in and she shuts the door behind her, her and her sons. And we pick it up. Uh, uh, And she poured out into all the vessels and you shall set aside what is full. Turn to your neighbor and say, what is full? So she went from him, she shut the door behind her, her and her sons, and they were bringing her the vessels to her and she Now, she had a little small jar of oil. So, this has got a little bit of water in it, but what she had would be pretty tiny because she said, all I've got is a little oil. Now, I can't make this food coloring multiply, but I can make it affect. All right? So the littlest bit can affect more, if that makes sense. So she had a little jar of oil, and she began to pour it into borrowed jars, but they had to be poured right to the top. She couldn't half fill them. She had to completely fill them. They had to be full. And there's an interesting reason for it all. So she shut the door behind her, and she began to pour it. Now, here is a key, a kingdom principle. Whatever you place in the hands of God has the power of multiplication. It's true. It's true. And the miracle isn't in what you placed in his hand. That's obedience. The miracle is the multiplication. So you place something in God's hands. That's just your alignment to what he's asked or your alignment to his kingdom principle. But the miracle is the fact that God can take that and multiply it into more. So that is why Elisha said, well, what have you invested in the house? Because the enemy has no legal right over it. He's got legal right over your debt, honey, but he's got no legal right over what you've got in the house. And so what you've got in the house, I can now take and see the power of multiplication kick in, and then let's see what happens with that. So he tells her these things, he gives her these instructions, and she goes. So she went from him, she shut the door, tick, 
behind her, tick, and behind her sons. They were bringing, yes, they were, the vessels, tick, to her, and she poured. So she was a self-governing person. She went and she did not leave the door standing open because if she did, the creditor would have seen what she was doing and would have wanted to make claim to that as well. He already wanted her sons. Don't you think he wanted everything else that was in her house? And the enemy wants to take every single one of us out. He doesn't want you to prosper. He doesn't want your family in the house. He doesn't want your children in the house. He doesn't want that. He wants to destroy absolutely everything. And of course, more than anything, and it's very clear in the word, he's after your sons and your daughters. Because he does, if he gets them, then what he believes, the power of Christ will then die with that. But that is not going to happen on my watch. That's for sure. Yes. Don't leave the door open to the next generation. Honestly, watch what they're looking at on Facebook. Watch what's being said by their friends. Check their Instagram accounts. See what's on the television and on the internet. Wake up, people. Look, honestly, honestly, I reckon that Adam must have built his house pretty close to that tree. I seriously do. It must have been within reach for Eve to have gone out and picked the fruit of the day. It, it wasn't on the other side of the Euphrates. It had to be pretty close at hand for her to be able to do that. But he chose the position of his family and where he positioned them. You know, I'm sorry, guys, but I, I have this thing, protect and provide. That's what guys are for. <laughs> protect and provide for your family. Protect and provide for your family. And I, actually, it's, it's in the Bible too. It's not just my opinion. Pre protect and provide. Quote, the opportunity of a lifetime only exists in the lifetime of the opportunity. Don't you know that one really well? Okay. The, li the opportunity of a lifetime, you watching us on live stream, only exists in the lifetime of that opportunity. Verse 6, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. Everything has a use-by date. Absolutely everything has a use-by date. And then the oil stopped. In other words, we're done here now. We've hit our use-by date, and we're done. Verse 7, then she came and she told the man of God, and he, and, and he said, sorry, she told the man of God, I have completed everything that you've told me to do. So please tell me what my next step is. See, we want to know what that next step is before we've completed what we're supposed to do. Don't we? Yeah. Or we think we can have what it is that that next step is going to bring to us without fulfilling the conditions of getting there in the first place. We take shortcuts. We don't fulfill all. He said, fill the jars full. And we have to fulfill all that God has said. And then we will receive what it is that he's promised because we have legal right. Because if we don't fulfill all, then we don't have legal right. And we just expect God's benevolence, which it does in so many cases. But the enemy will also stand on his legal right in your life. And if you've got the door open and he's got legal right, he will occupy it. And he will push you back. And then he will actually accumulate more things on his patch because that belongs to him. You can't leave the door open in your life. It's got to be shut. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So then he says to her, go and sell the oil. Now, if this was the oil that I filled to the top from the small jar and I filled a bottle, then when I go to the marketplace, I don't sell this. The person comes to me with their 
oil jars. They're perfume bottles. And I pour into that one. And I sell it. And I pour into the next one. And I'm making a mess. I'm a really bad cook as well. <laughs> And I don't do dishes. <laughs> so what I've borrowed, I now pour into other people's vessels. Right. I know I made a mess. I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. Oh. It's wonderful to have people take care. Thank you so much, Brenda. No blue? <laughs> there is a God in heaven. <laughs> Normally, it'd be all over me. That's why I was going to get Krista to do it, but she knew it'd be all over her too. <laughs> so go and decant what you've got in the big jar into smaller jars into other people's pockets. He said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons shall live on the rest. See, being obedient to God and fulfilling what it is he's asked us to do gives us the power to pay and the power to provide. So we take care of our past, but we also take care of our future. It's pivotal. It's pivotal. Our past is paid for and our future is provided for. And this is what happened right here. Now, I had a thought, backstory. What if that oil that she had was nard? Now, nard was used to perfume a body, a body for burial. And if you remember, Jesus was anointed. His feet, the vial of oil was broken all over his feet for his burial. Because he said to the woman who did it, this has been, she's done this for my burial. Now, Judas complained about her breaking the bottle of oil. It was nard. It was spike nard. The reason I link these two things together, because she just buried her husband. So it's, you know, a deduction. I know it's not in the word of God. But if it was nard, or no matter what the oil was, but if it was nard, then we get a glimpse in the New Testament of its value. And it said, uh, Judas said, you know, why should this not be sold and the money given to the poor for 300 denarii. Now, that is a year's wage. Wow. wow. So, if she created this, and it was worth a year's wage, but she had gone and she had borrowed maybe 50 bottles, maybe 100 bottles, how many bottles did she borrow? When I Googled this, it kept coming up with 99 bottles of beer on the wall. <laughs> Seriously. And I went, ah, oh, I remember that song. <laughs> anyway, so how many did she have? I don't know, 50, 100, I don't know how many bottles she had. But basically one of them was a year's salary. And then she goes to the marketplace and she decants them into people's personal vials. And she is selling those, but this is worth a year's salary. So if she's got 50 of those, she's got 50 years worth of income for her and her sons. If there's 100, then she's got 100 years worth of income for her and her sons. And it all started with something small that she had in the house because the enemy has no right to it. The enemy has no right to it at all. She borrowed the vessels, and I believe she had to return them. Because once she decanted them, this now would have been empty. But there's something interesting about oil. I don't know if you've ever tried to wash a bottle after it's had oil in it. You can't get the oil out. It sticks and clings to the side. Now, she doesn't want to get into the same predicament that her husband was in, where he borrowed and was in debt. So she took that which she borrowed 
and she returned it to who she borrowed it from. Okay, this is deduction. She returns it to who she borrowed it from because she doesn't want to accrue another debt. But when she returns that, something is left behind. There is an anointing and an oil inside that. See, sometimes we feel like we're used, and we, sometimes we feel like people borrow us and make us pour out more than what we really were anticipating would happen, but yet there's still something left behind for us. God will never leave you empty. He will always leave you with something for you. I looked at it this way. If we look at a set of scales, my debt of sin was far greater than any asset that I had. But Jesus came along, and the asset of Jesus Christ in my life outweighed my debt of sin. And that is the simple fact of it. I could never pay back anything that my Jesus did for me. But maybe if I invest something in the house, it will multiply beyond my life. And sure, there's something there for me. But when I take it to the marketplace, it will accrue and bring value. Not just to me, but to the marketplace itself. It will change things. It will have some value outside of the four walls. But that's where I have to begin, is what's on the four walls in my life and what is it full of? Because the bottom line is, is what am I pouring out when I leave this place? That's what it is. What am I pouring out? There was a statement that the, um, that the kids had and that we also used on Reflection Sunday. And I think it was Tyson who said it. Here's the promise city for City Impact Church. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. It was one of the scriptures that he pulled together and that it was part of our Reflection Sunday. Church, here's the prayer and the promise that the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. But they will be if what you are doing is pouring what he has already poured into you and your value is found out in the marketplace but your source is found in the house. Amen, church. Amen.